Today, on location in London, the American director, Anthony Mann, began work on a new spy thriller, Dandy in Aspic. His most recent films were El Cid, The Fall of the Roman Empire, and The Heroes of Telemark. A few weeks ago, I talked to him about his work, and in particular, about his remarkable series of westerns. They include Winchester 73, The Far Country, Where the River Bends, and The Man from Laramie, which will all be shown on BBC television. What you see is the only truth. And if you can make it all, what the audience see, as real and as truthful, then you, you don't have to say things. If you ever asked anybody in an audience what an actor said or an actress said, they would never know. But what they have done, or some piece of business, or some moment, they can tell you vividly because they've seen it. <laughs> Having been in the theater, having directed in the theater, having been stage manager for some of the great directors like Jed Harris and Ruben Mamoulian and Chester Erskine and Winter Baines and so forth. And uh, then gradually, uh, then I was an actor for a while and uh, at the neighborhood playhouse. And we played plays like the Dibbuk, Little Clay Cart, and things like that. And gradually, um, I learned enough about at least I was learning about uh, uh, acting and about uh, staging, and then I staged my own plays, like Thunder on the Left of Christopher Morley's on Broadway and so forth. And then, gradually, um, David Selznick actually gave me my first glimpse of the picture business in the sense that uh, he allowed me to make tests for him, for, with all the great actors. I made tests for Gone with the Wind and for Tom Sawyer and for all oh, many films. And in this way, I was able to cut the films and so forth and so on. And gradually, I became uh, deeply interested in films. In this way, uh, with all different kinds of scenes and so forth, and I used to cut them and send them out to the coast. And in this way, I, I learned enough to be able to... Uh, so they finally sent me out to the coast. What directors influenced you? I mean, presumably, at the time when you started, you went to, to see films? Certainly, I would say that... I have been influenced by three or four directors. I think Murnau was a very fantastic director. Actually, he was the man who could tell a story without any dialogue, because he, he worked more in the silent films anyway, and could create an emotion by the use of the long shot, the gradual closer close up. If you remember in, in, in Taboo, where uh, the swimmer is swimming, trying to get to the girl, and first you're in big close-ups on the arms and so forth and the face and then they're slowly going away and the shot gets longer and longer and longer and then the shot gets closer and closer until his hand reaches the rope and it's a close-up of a hand and a rope and it slides and then the boat goes away and it gets longer and longer and longer until you finally just see the boat so he told a whole emotion a whole story with just pictures It's a medium which communicates to more people than any other medium in the world in sense of immediacy. It's marvelous to see, for instance, 
El Cid in India. I mean, they just adored it. They beat on the ground like mad, you know. It was wonderful because they, it, it, at least it got to them, even though they couldn't understand a word, what was going on. And of course, this is really the medium because it's a sight medium. And this is the one thing which I, if I have anything, I would say is, is part of the, the quality that I have, and that is that I believe that everything should be, should be photographed. It should be a picture. It should be an action. And this is what pictures are. And this is, uh, Shakespeare used beautiful words and magnificent uh, descriptions. I could uh, have, a, have a, a shot of the desert and a, a twister going down the desert just before King Lear rides across it before he gets involved in the hurricane. And the hurricane can be something that's, fr it's all there. I don't have to ex describe it. Because in one shot, I can tell it. In this scene from The Tin Star, instead of using conventional cross-cutting, man concentrates the attention of the spectator by using deep focus. The good thing about it is you can put the character that you want the audience to really focus on, close. Yes. And all the other characters can be relatively in different positions uh, 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 so that the scene becomes his scene and because everybody is focusing on him. And yet, so therefore he's close and everybody else is partaking of the scene but are not as important at that moment. So you can use camera and shots uh, beautifully this way because drama then you don't have to say look at him he's there and everybody else is looking at him therefore he is there that's why cam the, the film and cameras and television and things like this can create a greater immediacy and a greater power because you can focus the audience on exactly what you want them to look at you see rather than uh, looking on the stage and then having to to, to, with your eye and your ear, capture what you want to capture. Man's first really successful film was T-Men, made in 1947. But his most important work was the series of westerns he made in the 50s. You can take any of the great dramas, doesn't matter whether it's Shakespeare, doesn't matter whether it's uh, Greek plays or what. You can always lay them in, in the west and they somehow become alive and, they, and this kind of passion and this, this drama, you can have patricide, every kind of side, uh, you know, in a Western, and you can get away with it because it is, uh, it's sort of uh, where all action took place. Winchester 73, made in 1950, was the first of the psychological Westerns in which the hero is seen as a complete character and not just a man in a white hat. When Stuart attacks the man at the bar, it would be hard to say whether he was the hero or the heavy. I've been riding the this was the first of a series of westerns that man made with James Stewart and the scriptwriter Borden Chase. Together, they created a unique hero. He was a man who could kill his own brother. So therefore, he was not really a hero. I mean, after all, uh, in, in, in uh, Winchester 73, he went out to destroy the man who, who, who killed his father, and it happened to be his brother. So he killed his brother. This is as powerful a kind of a strong yarn as you can tell. Uh, actually, the, the, it was a man with a purpose, really, more than just a hero. He was a man who said, I want to go from here to here, and did, even though a million things could happen in between that. He always got there. This is, uh, and so therefore you don't need to necessarily say it's a hero, but you say it's a man with a purpose. And the man with a purpose who gets somewhere. I think this is also something that's very, uh, that audiences uh, <clears throat> love to see, because they love to see people who accomplish something, as opposed to many, so many people who don't have the chance or given the opportunity to, to accomplish something. Therefore, I think in that sense, it's not really a, so much a hero, but, you can call him a hero, in a sense. You know. In the far country, the hero's purpose is personal and even antisocial. The far country is set against a background of the Yukon gold rush. Man has an obvious liking for working on location 
and in particular he uses mountains as both physical obstacles and symbols of ambition. I've actually done all my films practically. If I possibly can, I do them. All on location, you can't always, but uh, because there's a reality, there's a great, great sense of reality. Because actors don't, they, 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 they're not bothered by the silence of a studio and the, and the scenery and so forth. They're involved because they have to run up a flight of stairs or they have to walk down the street and the wind is blowing or the rain is raining or whatever is happening, they become more alive and more real because they are de they're with the elements. They're, they're battling the elements. And if, for instance, Westerns, of course, this is the great thing about Westerns because you do all the picture on location. And if an actor has to run up a hill, he has to pant. Now, in the studio, it's very difficult for an actor to pant properly. You know, he fakes it, but it doesn't, it's never real. It's never, his blood doesn't rush to his head. And therefore, he's, um, he's less uh, active. He's, he's, he's less vibrant. And all these things help in creating a film. Perhaps the chief obstacle to the progress of man's heroes is not the country, but the violence and even the sadism of other men. This particular sequence in The Man from Laramie proved too violent for the censor in 1955. Of course, violence is a very strange thing. Uh, if, you, if you follow all the great plays, whether they're Greek, Shakespearean, the most violent writer that's ever been, uh, heads roll, most gruesome. Oh, and even in King Lear, when they, when they jab Gloucester's eyes out with the with spurs. I haven't done that yet. I, I use the spur, though, the naked spur for a weapon. Uh, but actually, this is true of, of great drama, that it, it needs violence, because the audience is sitting there, and they are experiencing things, and then, in order for it to take hold, the dramatist really needs this kind of uh, pictorialness or uh, creativity to, to express an emotion, for the character to go through something that the audience feel for. It's been used in all the miracle plays. It was used in every kind of form of theater. So I don't think it's, uh, it's not something that's, uh, the, that's particularly mine, though I love this kind of theater. I mean, Macbeth is full of it. Man likes to bring the conflicts between his characters to an extremely violent crisis, as in this sequence from The Man from Laramie. When the man hero comes up against violence in others, He's also brought face to face with violence in himself. In Man of the West, Gary Cooper, with a knife held at his throat, has been forced by his old outlaw friends to watch as a girl he's protecting is made to strip. Later in the film, in a fit of anger, he reverts to the brutal pattern of the life he has tried to live down. With these westerns behind him, man came to Europe, where he made El Cid, the fall of the Roman Empire, and the heroes of Telemark. He has now started work on his new film, Dandy in Aspic. What attracted him to the subject? I did El Cid in the Fall of the Roman Empire, which were enormous, monstrous things, you know, and and now I'm going, I'm, I, I want to do something that's just about characters and about, uh, and has the realism that is today, that is, so that every place I shoot, I, it will be real. It'll be the rooms will be real, the the track, the Avis track, which I use in Berlin, the restaurant, which is a uh, tower restaurant, will be the restaurant. Everything that I do in this film, I will again do as a, in rooms and uh, in places in London, all over all over England, in fact, and then in uh, Berlin and, uh, and on the outskirts of Berlin. But it's really not the country this time. It's uh, men who kill men who are in a cold war and can't have an emotion because if they have an emotion they're dead so they're they're men who mustn't look at somebody and have heart because if you have heart you cannot do what they have to do and it's the english the russians in fact the hero of, his, of the story is a russian there's another reason why i did it because he's not a hero none of them are heroes i have a feeling that audiences don't like uh, heroes anymore. They're much more interested in anti-heroes. And this is a story of anti-heroes. There are no heroes. 
Man's subject is really the problem of heroes. The landscape is heroic, the pioneer situation is heroic, but man casts doubts on the heroism of the men. In this sequence from where the river bends, the almost geometric compositions in depth represent the director's wish to integrate his heroes with their environment. But violence is a perpetual obstacle, and finally, we're left with a man alone. He never showed his personal ambitions really uh, in glorification. It was always a man who had gone through so much that when the time came and he finally got there, he was exhausted. He was not exalted, he was exhausted. Therefore, it gave it a great reality because very few people are exalted. Now, in El Cid, this was a legend. He could be exalted. So, and even though he rode to victory on a, uh, when he was dead, strapped to his horse, there was great exaltation because this is, this is with the romantic, the great romantic kind of uh, chronicle legends that were written in those days. But in the Western, I don't think you'll find any of them uh, where the hero feel. I think in the Ford Westerns you do has achieved, I mean, and, and is happy. I, I, I don't think I've ended any of my films with any kind of exaltation. Really more tired, and he's done the job, and thank heaven it is done. That sort of feeling.